I'm Thomas Sederborg and I will be presenting my thesis, A Formal Approach to Social Learning, Exploring Language Acquisition Through Imitation. What type of social learning? Uh, there are many different types of social learning and I will be focusing on a specific subset. And that is a learner trying to do what a teacher wants it to do. And this is different from observing that doing X resulted in Y. You could, for example, have a chimpanzee that puts a stick down an ant hill, pulls it up again, and then eats the ant. You would have another chimpanzee looking at this and seeing if I put a stick in an ant hill like this, then I can eat ants. This is social learning, and but it's different from trying to do what a teacher wants you to do. It's also not the same as trying to get positive feedback. You could imagine a child trying to get uh, praise or a child trying to avoid getting yelled at by an adult. Uh, you could also imagine a uh, dog uh, trying to get as much uh, get as much uh, treats as possible from a human, or you could imagine a chimpanzee uh, doing things in order to get uh, uh, get as much uh, positive feedback as possible. This is also a form of social learning, but it is again different from trying to do what a teacher wants you to do. Uh, one example difference would be that. Uh, if you mess up, you do a mistake, it might be a good idea to try to hide it in order to maximize the positive feedback. So it is quite different. And of course, if you're just observing that doing something results in something else, uh, you're, you're not, you don't care at all what, what, uh, what the teacher thinks of you. Uh, so it's also quite different. So this particular type of social learning is uh, the subject of the thesis and each experiment presented here will be a example of that and the talk will also be completely focused on this. So three very related types of social learning will be focused on imitation learning, language learning and learning to understand teacher comments. And these are definitely not uh, uh, incompatible. You have uh, language learning uh, can be a form of imitation learning. You can imitate a teacher and adopt the teacher's linguistic conventions. Also, learning to understand teacher comments is uh, can definitely be seen as a form of social learning. But there is three parts to this talk, and each one will, f uh, the first one will focus on imitation learning, the second one will focus on language learning, and the third one will focus on learning to understand teacher comments. There, there's no sharp boundaries, and they're certainly not mutually exclusive. Uh, so imitation learning, we, uh, there's been a lot of research in imitation learning and uh, we can start with uh, Delson and West from 96 where uh, a set of demonstrated trajectories span a space of, uh, of the acceptable trajectories. So you have demonstrations uh, which uh, in the form of trajectories through space and uh, it is this approach defines uh, acceptable reproductions as any trajectory that goes in between them, that goes in the space spanned by them. And uh, this, uh, this is a uh, approach that relies on the fact that demonstrations are, uh, are produced in the space, in the task space of the robot. So it avoids, uh, specifically it avoids, avoids the correspondence problem. If you have uh, one uh, learner that is observing another teacher he has to map what the teacher is doing onto his own body. Uh, this is called the correspondence problem, and in response to this, uh, we have Nihanov and Dautenham from 2000 offering a systematic framework covering different embodiments. It's called hummingbirds and helicopters, and uh, if you want, if you have a helicopter that wants to imitate a hummingbird, it's clear that it can't uh, do that by flapping its wings. It will, it can, for example, go up and down or left and right, and in that sense, it can imitate the hummingbird. Uh, but uh, you don't have to go to such extreme uh, differences. If you have a, a, a grown-up human and then a uh, child uh, that is uh, imitating, or if you have a smaller robot that is imitating, you already have the correspondence problem. Imagine that the, the human, just uh, the adult human, waves its hand, just normally waves its hand. If the child wants to reproduce the same trajectory, it would have to stand on its feet and wave really, really, uh, really much. Uh, while you could also imagine that it would simply imitate by doing 
the same type of movement relative to its own body and its own size, so that the joints of its elbow and shoulder would be similar to that of the adult human. Uh, so there is different mappings that are possible from the human uh, demonstrator onto the uh, to the learner. Uh, and <coughs> there's been a lot of uh, imitation learning work since 2000. I will be focusing on a specific set, which is learning from demonstration using Gaussian mixture regression. And the reason I'm focusing on this is because algorithmically it's quite similar to these experiments uh, and the algorithms that I will be presenting. Uh, the algorithms are uh, specifically are an exten extension to Gaussian mixture regression. So uh, here we have using GMR to learn a single task by Kalinon and Billard from 2006. In this case, we see a form of kinesthetic teaching, which is you take the hand of the robot and you perform a demonstration. This means that you're avoiding the correspondence problem because the demonstrations are performed in the space of the robot. The robot doesn't have to uh, observe a demonstrator doing something and then map that onto its own body. It's already clear. The human waves the hand of the robot. Uh, you know, When the robot reproduces, it's the same space. Uh, so it avoids the correspondence problem. In this case, you have uh, here we see multiple examples with varying starting position. You see the hands start in two different positions, but they still move the queen uh, in the same way. And I like this uh, chess bot uh, thing because the uh, old style uh, problems that were the traditional problems that were explored was about uh, 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 this the chess type uh, rule based. Uh, Worlds were fully visible and uh, uh, fully visible worlds with discrete states and uh, clear rules. Uh, and uh, here you have a different type of chess bot. And I like it. It's symbolic of the uh, uh, paradigm shift that has been taking place. So that's why I like this example. Here we see uh, Gaussian mixture models. Uh, in this case, you have uh, three trajectories uh, and you have five Gaussian generators that approximate this task. The reason you need five is because of the shape of the trajectories. Uh, and then you have, uh, down to the left, we see in blue here, we have a re regression that's, uh, you, you do regression on a Gaussian mixture model. So that's why it's called Gaussian mixture regression. And here we have a reproduction in a different context. So you see all the chess pieces have been moved a bit, uh, but it still does the same still moves the queen to uh, to the same uh, to in between the uh, the two black chess pieces and there's been a lot of language related research and specifically uh, language is no longer seen as a free floating symbol system you can see for example uh, the this kangalosia from 2010 uh, uh, the roadmap and uh, uh, the italk project and it's been uh, for quite a long time for decades actually that uh, language is is no lo is not seen as this free floating symbol system, but uh, actually there's a lot of emphasis on the fact that it's very strongly linked with action, uh, uh, and you see the action system and the language system are often seen as very highly inter interlinked. However, there's still a separation. No one is really. It's it's hard to find experiments where uh, you have a single action system that, for example, imitates actions and that the exact same system with the exact same strategy is also learning linguistic tasks. So that uh, the same pro uh, tackling the same problem and dealing uh, with the same problem. This is what we're going to do in this talk. There is one uh, example uh, where, uh, where you learn multiple tasks uh, and one of, the, one of the aspects that uh, decide what the robot, should, the robot imitator should do is actually a human making gestures. So this can be seen as world learning. This is uh, Mohammed and Nishida from 2010, but in general it's hard to find these. Uh, another example of language uh, research uh, is uh, language games. Uh, for example, the learning of words uh, for actions in Steel and Spanger 2008. But there's a large number of different uh, publications on these uh, language games. They all have in common that you have a community of non-linguistic agents that pair up and interact two and two. Then you have a large number of such interactions. They negotiate a language. Each agent is trying to adopt uh, the, uh, the conve li linguistic conventions that it thinks that the others are using. And it also, in some cases, invents linguistic conventions. 
Then I would like to mention joint intentionality. You can see, for example, the book by Thomas Heller from 2008. And this is uh, describing the uh, a task of joint intentionality where two people, two or more people, have the same goal, and they all know they have the same goal. For example, lifting a sofa. If you both, if you're lifting a sofa with someone else, and you both know where it's supposed to end up, you have shared intentionality. Uh, because you know, both of you know that you have the same goal. So if you both just happen to have the same goal, it's not joint intentionality, but if you both know you have the same goal. Uh, because in that case, uh, if you say anything you say and do will be interpreted in terms of this joint goal. And here you have a collaborative lifting task. Uh, it's uh, Everall from 2009. And uh, so here you have actions of another agent is relevant to policy. Uh, it doesn't really look like it's a linguistic experiment, and that's not how it's described. However, the r this robot needs to take the actions of a human into account uh, for what it should do. So when the human does something with its hands, its hand, the robot has to take this into account and respond to it. Uh, and this is not really linguistic, but uh, it's not that different from having to respond to speech or gestures. Uh, so, so this is how we're, and this is close to how we're going to achieve language learning through imitation by ha by replacing this uh, the movement with uh, speech or gestures. And the main theme of the thesis and the main theme of the talk is uh, implicit assumptions, hidden ambiguities. So much existing work making implicit assumptions and making them explicit reveals new avenues of research. Unlabeled demonstrations, that's the first experiment. So most imitation learning research assumes that uh, we know that a single task is being uh, is being demonstrated. So you have a number of demonstrations and you know that it's of a single task. If we relax this assumption, uh, you get the setup of the first experiment. That is, th you have an unknown number of tasks and you don't know which demonstrations are what task. Uh, adding and communicating interactant to the context. So uh, this is an extension of imitation learning and it comes uh, from the extension of existing imitation learning techniques. And it comes from uh, relaxing the assumption made in much language research, which is that you have a clear channel of communication. You know that it's, for example, speech or gestures that is supposed to be associated to something else. Only partially understood feedback. Uh, much learning algorithms make implicit assumptions uh, about the fact that we know what the feedback means. For example, it could be a reward uh, signal, and we know if the reward signal is uh, for incremental progress or if it's for absolute performance. The same thing if we... So usually you, you assume that you know what the feedback means. We're going to relax that assumptions and get the third experiment. Uh, in this case, you would have words such as uh, yes being understood and words uh, good robot not being understood. So in this case, you would have... <coughs> the robot expanding an un its understanding of the feedback. It starts with some understanding, but it expands it. And this is another uh, avenue of research. So, and uh <coughs> finally, there is a formalism that aims to systematize assumption relaxation within this particular type of social learning. So when in this subfield of social learning, where a learner is trying to do what a teacher wants it to do, uh, this formalism aims to systematize making assumptions uh, explicit in order to find new ways of relaxing them. So if when you make an assumption explicit, then each way of relaxing them, uh, those assumptions, leads to a new avenue of research. And the talk is built up of uh, three main contributions. Uh, learning an unknown number of tasks from unlabeled demonstrations, learning language without a specified communication channel, and a conceptualization uh, formalism of social learning designed to make assumptions explicit. So we'll only present the conceptual framework of the formalism and uh, example experiment, not the actual details of the formalism. So we're starting with this, the first part of the talk. <coughs> and this setup is uh, consists of three separate coordinate systems. So you have a robot moving its hand in a uh, relation to itself, in relation to the starting position, and in relation to the object. So since the object and the starting position will be different in each demonstration and different in each reproduction, 
if you two uh, two trajectories might look the same in one coordinate system but might look quite different in another coordinate system so if you move your hand around the object and the object twice and the object moves then the uh, movement the two movements might uh, might look very different um, uh, might look very very much the same in the coordinate system of the robot but not in the coordinate system of the stalking position we're making a lot of simplifications here. One, kinesthetic teaching. This avoids the correspondence problem, as we described before. Uh, the, the demonstrations are provided in the in the space uh, in the task space of the robot. Direct control of the end effector. This avoids uh, having to know how to Im imitate. So, one of the questions of uh, imitation learning is uh, how do I imitate? Uh, not just what to do, but how to do it. So even if a robot knows exactly where or its hands and feet should be at each point in time, it might be difficult to find the motor outputs that generates these uh, positions. So we're avoiding this problem. We also have a fully simulated environment, avoiding, avoiding all problems related to real robots. So how do we deal with unlabeled demonstrations? We have an unknown number of tasks and we don't know which demonstration is of uh, what task. So this is based on the IROS paper from 2010. So the number of tasks is not known. The object positions will determine what task to perform. So this rule is not known uh, to the imitator. It's uh, a rule that the demonstrator follows and that the imitator has to figure out or infer. An online regression on a subset of the data will be used to solve this. Uh, so the subset of the data will be collected in a way that uh, it, it collects the, the points in the demonstrations that are the closest to the current position. And since the current pos that includes the object position, so the data collected will be that data which is relevant to the task currently being performed. We have four tasks. So when the object is close to the upper right corner, the task is to move the hand in an S-shaped trajectory. When close to lower left corner, the task is to move the hand in a circle around the object. Lower right, a big square, upper left, move hand to the object. And the algorithm is incremental local online Gaussian mixture regression. And it's an adaptation of Gaussian mixture regression. So local points are selected at each time step. Regression on those points determines an action. So we're building Gaussians out of the local points. And those Gaussians uh, suggest an action. And then new local points are selected. Uh, because after the action, we're in a new position. We have a new, new current position, which means that we need to select new local points. And here I show an illustration of what a trajectory might look like. So each point consists of a position and a direction. So we have see a set of trajectories in our current position. We select a few uh, local points, create Gaussians. And uh, creating a small number of Gaussians is uh, very, very fast. The, num uh, the number of uh, Gaussians in a, in, in a Gaussian mixture model uh, is strongly uh, influences the, the time uh, very much. So uh, the computational time scales very badly in the number of Gaussians, which means that since we just have a small number of Gaussians, we can do this online. We can create new Gaussian mixture models each time step. So the Gaussian mixture model proposes an action. This leads to a new position, which leads to new local points. Then we iterate like this. And this demonstration is of one task. So you have the object position in red, the starting position in blue and the demonstrated tra trajectory, the S shape. Here we have three additional tasks. So three demonstrations uh, shown here of each task. In total, there's four demonstrations of each task. Uh, so first one, we move hand in a circle around the object, move hand in a large square and move hand to object. And using the incremental local online Gaussian mixture regression, we get these results. Uh, reproductions shown in three different framings. So here we have four different reproductions. So this is the same set of four reproductions shown in three different framings, three different coordinate systems. And the relevant coordinate system to be looking at for this task is the green one, the starting position framing. Uh, and that is because that's 
the framing in which the task is defined. If you look to the, at the blue here at the robot framing, then you have several points uh, where uh, the same position yields different outcomes, uh, yields different policy. That doesn't really matter because that's not the, the coordinate system that the task is defined in. And we can see that it makes these uh, four nice S's. So uh, we can see that this is a correct reproduction. We have the three other tasks that are also successfully reproduced. Uh, we see the in upper middle, we see that they go uh, each trajectory goes to the uh, point zero zero. Uh, and you see uh, in the middle middle, you see that they go around the object. And then to the lower left, we see that the uh, uh, it's the, the square task, which is uh, defined in the coordinate system relative to the robot. We also see that it makes a big spread, so it's uh, successful. Now we move to the second part, uh, learning language without a specified communication channel. So we're introducing another, another human, an interactant. This is based on the Tumblr article from 2013. And the interactant fills the same function as the object position. Uh, the human produces speech and gestures, and we have non-symbolic, fully continuous communicative acts. So it's raw speech data, there's no symbols, and uh, this, the actions are also uh, not, th they're never exactly the same, and their uh, so communicative gestures are human produced and uh, not symbolic. And it's not always com communicating. Sometimes the object position is the only relevant part of the context uh, or the starting position. So communicative tasks are not marked, and uh, we need to, fi the imitator needs to figure out what was it in, in each demonstration, what was it that made the demonstrator do what it did. Here we see the the situation that is being uh, uh, approximated. So this is just to show this. Is we, this is not the uh, we're not using a now robot. This is just to uh, sim to exemplify what we're trying to do. Here we have an imitator, an interactant. Uh, in a, so this is the context to the left, where uh, the interactant performs a uh, in this case performs a gesture, and you have the demonstrator. Uh, responding to that gesture. Here we see again now it's the interactant and the imitator. Uh, the interactant performs a gesture, uh, not exactly the same one, but uh, and then the imitator responds to it. So you would have a large number of these uh, demonstrations, in, uh, a large number of demonstrations and after you would have this type of uh, reproduction. And here we see speech instead of gestures, it's basically the same. Uh, we have an interactant producing speech, and uh, again we have raw speech, there's no speech recognizer, and uh, the demonstrator responding to this. So novel ambiguities and major problems. We have finding the number of tasks, which is the same as grouping the demonstrations. So if you find out which demonstrations go together, then we also find out the number of tasks. Uh, finding the relevant framing context. So we need to figure out for each task which framing is it defined in? The, we have an unknown channel of communication. We don't know if it's gestures or speech that's relevant. And communicative tasks are not marked. So we don't know when uh, the demonstrator is responding to the interactant. We don't know when any type of communication is relevant. And But since uh, we're going to be using the same algorithm for both tasks, it's OK. We don't actually need to uh, have this uh, marked artificially. And we finally, a major problem is to reconstruct a trajectory from prototypes. This has been handled quite uh, uh, in the literature quite a lot. So when you have a set of trajectories that you know are of a single task and you know what the framing is, uh, you need to reconstruct the trajectory. We're going to use ILO GMR in this case. Uh, so we have two possibilities when an interactant produces a continuous representation of communicative acts. One is to do a classifier into a list of symbols. The other one is to transform it into a low dimensional space. So we're going to do the second one, transform it into a low dimensional space. This is because we have word spaces without obvious clusters. On the left we can see without clusters, so it's unclear how many words were spoken. To the right we know that there is four words spoken, because it's obvious uh, that they can be clustered. If you have clusters, so in word spaces with clusters, you can do this, you can do a clustering algorithm and then assign each cluster to a list of symbols. So you associate uh, a symbol with a region. You don't even need the, uh, the points anymore, the examples anymore. You just have uh, 
each region is associated to a symbol and then you get uh, this type of demonstration demonstration now is a symbol and an action symbol and an action symbol and action etc and they ca it can be used to build a symbol action association model then during reproduction you get your continuous input transform it into a symbol symbol action associated model uh, leads to an action instead we're doing this so correlations with actions we have a context and we have a response so we're going to say that two two uh, for example two speech acts are instances of the same word if they always lead to the same response so we're going to actually cluster in the response space in this case in trajectory space like in the hand movements of the demonstrator as a response to the context this is going to be used to find out the number of words uh, in uh, in the dem in uh, that the interaction has produced and the algorithm overview is uh, first the demonstrator interacts and produces a set of demonstrations then the imita imitator analyzes this and builds a model by a model i mean an estimate of which demonstrations are of the same task and which framing was relevant to uh, these tasks and finally the imitator responds to the interactant and the rest of the context and then it will respond online but using the model built in batch mode so we have batch learning algorithm you have demonstrated trajectories is uh, submitted to the similarity estimation you get a framing dependent similarity estimate and it's framing dependent because uh, to, uh, the, the similarity definition is uh, that two trajectories are high have high similarity if they have a consistent policy that if that is when they're in the same position they perform the same actions then they have high similarity and since being in the same position or not is framing dependent moving the hand around the object several times with different object positions uh, could represent a very a completely consistent policy in the coordinate system of the object but relative to the starting position it doesn't have to be co uh, to be coherent at all so this framing dependent similarity estimate gives a group uh, gives the grouping algorithm enough to work with to create a demonstration group estimate so with the similarity estimate you get an estimate of how many of which demonstrations go together and then when we have these groups so we know which demonstrations are of the same task and you also have the framing dependent similarity estimate then you can check which framing uh, is the correct one for each group and that is uh, the framing in which the, the group traje grouped trajectories look the most coherent so then this the demonstrate the group est uh, estimate and the framing estimate will be later used that's why we have these arrows in the reproduction algorithm so then you have the membership estimates and the framing estimates uh, in the step in step one group selections you have the context uh, and then you check which group has the context that are the most relevant to this uh, to the current context you select a group then you have framing estimates so the framing estimates uh, allow us to select the trajectory in the correct framing then st step three is online regressions you have the current context of course and then you have the trajectories in the in the correct framing and we're here using uh, ILO GMR just like in the previous experiment and here we see uh, two tasks to be executed in response to object positions uh, so this is demonstrations when the object is close to the lower left corner draw an L shape close to the lower right corner draw an R shape so if it's to the left draw an L right draw an R uh, then we have response to speech so response to W should draw a W shape W, w is uh, French for W and then circle is move the hand in a circle we have if you have the human produce an s shape the continuous uh, uh, human produce an s shape draw a square uh, and p shape push the object which is just draw a square in a the first one is draw a square sphere uh, square uh, in the coordinate system of the uh, object and the push the object just you know move the hand to the object to the point zero zero in the object coordinate system and uh, one talks to be executed in response to starting position so if it starts far away then just move to the point zero zero in the robot coordinate system and six out of six seven six out of seven tasks were uh, successfully reproduced uh, 
the seventh task was not correctly reproduced because the similarity estimate did not uh, consider it to be very uh, similar to each other. So it's more similar than to the other one, but the combination between the similarity and the grouping algorithm, it just didn't recognize this as a separate task. The other six were, however, correctly uh, successfully reproduced. And here we see the, the L, the R, the W, the circle, uh, the square and the uh, move to point zero zero down in, to the right in task six. So now we come to a conceptualization formaliz formalism of social learning designed to make assumptions explicit. Third part of the talk. So we have a learner trying to do what a teacher wants it to do. This is the type of social learning being formalized. Uh, it's not the same as imitating for a specific purpose and the main problem is to interpret the teacher. Obviously, even if we have a perfect interpretation of the th teacher, we still need to find what to do. We still need to learn the task. But uh, the main problem, as I see it, is to learn how to interpret the teacher, to learn what a uh, good robot actually means. Uh, observations are described as information sources. So demonstrations, speech comments, a reward signal, etc. all fill the same function in a learn al learning algorithm and on the conceptual framework is presented here. So why is this useful? Why do we want such a formalism? First part is to establish rules for success. This is useful in itself and it's also useful for uh, guiding experimental design. You have to make sure that you have possible but non-trivial uh, paths to success in your specific experimental design. Inspiring new types of research. Uh, again, if you uh, make hidden assumptions explicit, each time you do that you gain a large number of different uh, avenues for future research. And hi making hidden assumptions explicit is useful in itself. So if you have a, reward, uh, a human pushed reward button, you should uh, and your algorithms uh, learns from this. It's important to know that you assume that the human. Uh, I mean, many algorithms assume that the human is perfectly understanding the situation and is, for example, creating a, a, a measure of absolute performance, as opposed to incremental performance. So if the if the if the actual human deviates from this, for example, it doesn't notice certain things or it. Uh, does act uh, does incremental uh, it evaluates uh, incremental performance or it uh, a non expert human might even push it in order to give a fairly high reward in order to encourage the robot just for trying it for example so it's uh, making hidden assumptions explicit could be useful in itself because you d it gives you a better estimate of where in what domains your algorithms will work the core idea here is that the learner observes a set of information sources uh, and a subset of these have interpretation hypotheses. So you would, uh, if you observe uh, demonstrations and rewards and speech comments, uh, some of these you need to start with an some, uh, some understanding of some of these. Uh, but they are not assumed to be complete or flawless. So you can have a model, for example, of the speech comments. You understand some of the speech comments but it's not necessarily flawless because this will uh, it has to allow you to know what to do in some region or get a good idea a fairly good idea of what to do in some situations this can then be used to estimate the other information sources so if you know what to do in a certain area you can say ah oh, good uh, high number these high number numbers that i observe they're higher when i'm doing what i'm supposed to do and this can give you an estimate of, of what the numbers mean and how I should respond to them. So the, that would be a reward button, for example. Uh, a flawed interpretation hypothesis is not the same as a noisy information source. A noisy information source would be observing a reward button and uh, having 20% of the time it's scrambled. It's just random. And then having an update algorithm that takes this into account. So you have ambiguity in the, in the noise but uh, in the input, uh, but this is different from a flawed interpretation hypothesis. A flawed interpretation hypothesis would be 
uh, assuming that it's absolute performance while in fact it's incremental progress and this is different because it can be you can test it in a different way you see incremental progress and absolute performance makes different predictions in an observable space namely in the reward space so if you do the same thing uh, over and over again then they actually predict different uh, observations so you can actually update them so a flawed interpretation hypothesis can be fixed and uh, uh, it's, it's a different type of ambiguity as the noisy information source and we're going to give an example here which is uh, concurrently updating task and feedback models it's based on the uh, ICDL paper from 2011 uh, it deals with a specific type of interpretation hypothesis so teacher says a uh, comment of the type yes no go up go left and an incomplete lexicon is expanded so it would know less yes but it would not know good robot it would know understand no but it doesn't understand bad robot and uh, it uses its incomplete uh, lexicon to start building a task model and then it will uh, uh, continuously uh, expand the lexicon because if it knows what it's supposed to do uh, in some subset of the, uh, sometimes it knows what it's supposed to do, then it can start to interpret uh, and, and expand its lexicon and understand what previously unknown words meant. So the task is to collect objects. You have 64 states. Uh, this is this now we're moving to discrete states. There's no continuous uh, stuff anymore. You have three objects, and the agent has five move actions, uh, and uh, it can pick up or drop objects. So now we're in uh, discrete action space as well uh, it ha and we're also in the discrete word space so uh, in order to explore a new ambiguity we have to make uh, other assumptions uh, so we have 10 known words and 10 unknown words and the, uh, the, the it is known that uh, the, that the, the 10 words that are known are synonyms to the 10 words that are not known and you have 10% noise for the comments. So an update could be incorrect simply because uh, the word is, uh, you, the model of what the word means is wrong, but it could also be incorrect because the wrong word is heard. So symbols are being transmitted, but with a 10% noise. So you could have, uh, you could hear, uh, you could do the wrong update because you hear bad robot, but in reality, a uh, good robot was said. Or you could do the wrong update because you think that bad robot means good robot. So an algorithm overview. First, an action is selected, uh, the feedback is analyzed, and the task model is updated. And then the interpretation hypothesis is updated. So the task model update. The current best estimate of the word meanings is used. So we don't actually, at, the, at each step, we don't know exactly what all the words uh, mean but we have a current best estimate. And then a reward function is re-estimated. So we're, uh, what to do is here represented in terms of a reward function. And the interpretation model update, the current best estimate of the policy is used to update the reward meaning estimates. We have, for example, a new estimate of how well we acted when the comment was Gavagai. So we did something and uh, the comment was Gavagai. And now we have a better estimate of uh, how well we did. So this can be used to update the probability that Gavagai means good robot. So if we know that we did a bad thing, then Gavagai probably doesn't mean good robot. Can't be sure, but we can make a probabilistic update. And then we, uh, uh, there's a particle filter used here. The full Bayesian uh, update is not computationally feasible. And here we see the results, uh, task and interpretation uh, is uh, successfully learned. You have the interpretation accuracy at the top and then the policy error at the bottom. And you see that the words are learned and the policy error goes down. And the blue dots uh, represent active learning. So this is where actions are chosen in order to, uh, to be as informative as possible, to learn as, as, as fast as possible. So in summary, new ambiguities were explored in imitation learning, uh, unlabeled demonstrations of unknown number of tasks. We included a communicative agent in the context, thereby expanding imitation learning, uh, if you look at it in one way, and also relaxing a, uh, a 
hidden implicit assumption of uh, much language learning if you look at it another way new theoretical foundations were laid down uh, and uh, hopefully the first steps towards a general and structured way of re-estimating how a teacher should be interpreted were were taken so there are some major problems that we that were not dealt with in the thesis uh, and therefore also not in the talk Large vocabularies is a challenge for the algorithms used. The grouping algorithm doesn't scale well with large vocabularies, and uh, but this is uh, uh, the th this should be fixable in the sense that it's fairly well suited for a uh, non-batch uh, extension, so that you would learn a number of words, create uh, fi figure out which uh, learn a number of words figure out which demonstrations are of uh, which words and then once you have this grouping you can learn another set of words that would uh, that would make the uh, grouping algorithm uh, tractable for much larger vocabulary uh, then we have more theoretical constraint which is words that have no directly noticeable behavioral effect so we're imitating the response that a demonstrator has to a word so if I say run and the demonstrator runs this can be interpreted uh, but if I say something uh, say that the sky is blue it's harder to interpret perhaps if he looks at the sky you can uh, you can make some sort of uh, assumption that you can make some sort of inferences ideally but it's hard to uh, uh, it's harder to imitate this type of uh, uh, of words uh, in the thesis we made uh, one step in the sense that uh, we made an internal uh, cognitive operations were imitated because those internal cognitive operations had an immediate effect on behavior. So it would be uh, uh, of the sort, look at the bottle, uh, give it to me. So look at the bottle or look at the box or look at the phone uh, and then give it to me. So uh, first we have a foc in, uh, like focusing the attention of the demonstrator and then that would have an, that had an immediate effect on the actions so you can hypothesize this uh, also physical robots in unstructured interactions with non-expert humans this opens up an entirely an, a whole new uh, set of problems but this is what uh, this is the uh, ideal uh, this is the ideal scenario so we want non-expert humans and we want real physical robots and unstructured interactions because that, that's when you get all these ambiguities uh, that we're trying to uh, to deal with so uh, because non-expert humans behave in uh, in ways that are very uh, very messy and uh, not very ordered and uh, the uh, relaxing assumptions about uh, the teacher is will be necessary if we have non-expert humans because they will not always uh, adhere to these uh, too rigid assumptions of how best to teach a, uh, how one should teach a robot finally experimentally evaluating general methods for reinterpretation of multiple information sources so what uh, ideally one should test experimentally uh, methods that uh, re reinterprets uh, in information sources uh, and that does not make assumption regarding what those information sources are. So you would uh, ideally you would have uh, algorithms that uh, that just uh, update information sources without knowing what they are. So you would use the same algorithm for say demonstrations and EEG readings as you would use for speech comments and a reward signal or facial expressions so uh, uh, and this was not done in the thesis uh, but it's a major problem that would be a logical next step and that was the end of the presentation of my thesis <laughs>